I'm uh, Dr. Kribis Habst. I'm the director of SAPRIN, the South African Population Research Infrastructure, which is one of the national research infrastructures that are funded by the Department of Science and Innovation. Uh, as a, it's called the South African Research Infrastructure Roadmap, and it's a roadmap to significantly enhance the capacity to do research over a wide variety of fields uh, in South Africa. SAPRIN is a network of health and demographic surveillance sites. Uh, we have currently five such sites that, have act that are active and we will be shortly expanding this with two more sites. We enumerate everyone living in a defined uh, geographic area. Uh, and by everyone, I mean every household and all the members of those households that are living in that area. So we have this accurate record of the population in the area and we keep on doing that. And most of our nodes have been doing that for more than 20 years. As a result, we've built up an accurate picture of the population in these rural and also now urban areas. Our center, its main focus, it's a, it's a demographic surveillance center. So we're in on an annual basis, we do the enumeration of the population in our study area. So we do surveillance on 100,000 population, wherein we would like to know in terms of the population dynamics, the population growth, we look into the births and the deaths. Then we also look into who is coming into the uh, study population, who is leaving the study population. We also look again into the socioeconomic status of our community members. Based in the village of Agincourt in Bushbuck Ridge is the research centre which is the hub of the activity here. There are about 120,000 households in villages around here, around that research centre, and teams go out with a choreographed logistical operation with uh, tablet computers, and they uh, interview uh, people, they get consent and interview people, and also, um, well, the first round is at a household level, and other rounds um, are at an individual level. They also provide a specimen of blood through a dry blood spot, which enables us to keep track of certain health conditions. Um, especially important there is uh, HIV and also um, diabetes. There's a measurement of diabetes you can take from the dry blood spot, which means at a population level we can um, understand things like the prevalence or the uh, severity of diseases like this. So all of that requires an enormous amount of data and processing. Of course there is also uh, important ethics control and having um, um, advisory boards within the community about that uh, make sure that people are content to continue participating over a long period. That's how it stays stable over time. The um, then the data has to be a rigorous data environment where um, it's both protected but also accessible to use because uh, these scientific riches need to be ex need to be used by universities not just our own university but we link to other universities in the country and in the world so although it is a dusty rural hub it's a hive of activity So samples that are collected from the field up near Kanyakuda area uh, will have been delivered to our laboratory on site and stay there overnight. The following day samples are brought by the RE specimen shuttle to our facilities in Durban. So we store at minus 20 degrees typically in plastic containers, um, in plastic bags and then at minus 20 degrees. 
and then once samples are ready for testing they get retrieved by the testing laboratory samples are then once again QC'd and just checked to make sure we've got the right sample for what we are expecting to test they get punched and then they go through the HIV ELISA process so various chemicals and reagents are added with various incubation times and at the end of that process we determine the optical density of the sample which from the color change that you can see probably on the video is indicated by the higher intensity of the yellow color change so the darker samples indicate the likelihood that this person has antibodies to HIV and is therefore positive for HIV. Uh, I think it's very important to add urban surveillance to rural surveillance because we already know quite a lot about rural areas because the rural nodes of Saprin have been running for, in some cases, more than 20 years. But the country is urbanizing uh, at a really fast rate, as is Africa as a whole. So I think it's, it's absolutely critical that we have nodes that are able to understand the how and the where of where people live in urban centers. So the challenges of setting up an urban node, I think, have been quite extraordinary. If you think about the year that's gone, we had an insurrection that failed. We had elections, we had a census, we've had ongoing Operation Dulula. Um, you know, we've been buffeted by everything that's been going through the community, particularly violence and insecurity, um, because those were from insurrection through the election campaigns. The, the census just disrupted fieldwork um, because it, they have to be there and, and we supported the census in, in being there. Um, but I think the ongoing trouble with Operation Dulula um, the insecurity that is felt on the street, the extent to which our field workers are accused of being foreigners as if that's a crime. I think those are posing very severe challenges to us right now. How the building was conceived, it has been a, a lengthy process. We had a Professor Albert, uh, whom she is the champion of what we are in today. So unfortunately she passed away last year. May her soul rest in peace. So she has been the brains behind uh, the initiation of the health and demographic surveillance side here at the University of Limpopo. The key features which we have, which we did not have before the funding, is mainly our own laboratory. Another key feature which we have in the building it is the server room. The server room is where now we are able to save our data, wherein we know that safely the data which we have has been stored, then we have a backup server within the university server room. So our own server, if anything happens to it, we know that we have a backup server at the main university ICT uh, site. Then thirdly, we have the call center system which is another essential feature in this building wherein uh, we are able now to collect data in the community through telephonic uh, system. This helped us a lot during the hard COVID-19 pandemic wherein we were able to go into the field. We therefore resorted to do telephonic data collection which did not interrupt much in terms of our project implementation process. Then the last feature which we have in this building is the postgraduate uh, room wherein we are housing the postgraduate students. Previously our postgraduate students did not have a place wherein they could be able to sit, do their research, do their writing. But currently we have a bigger room wherein the postgraduate students can sit, then work, they are able to consult with us uh, closer rather than them being housed in other buildings. What is the benefit of doing this? In the first instance, we produce data. So it's data that has scientific value because it enhances our understanding of population and social dynamics. It also looks at the burden and the epidemiology of diseases so that we know that the course of diseases can change over time and they can, can be a new disease like COVID uh, appearing all of a sudden. And because this infrastructure is there, it allows us to immediately study that new disease 
without having to create a new capabilities uh, to study that disease. And the network could pivot very quickly to look at the epidemiology of, of COVID. There is an unprecedented opportunity to work in a place like this because of the infrastructure in place, the platform. This is actually a treasure, this platform here. It's been here a long time, towards 30 years, but now it's in a particularly good position having been here um, for this long and worked within these communities for a long time. This brings a stability that makes research here able to follow up people over long periods of time and that makes a lot of sense when you are trying to understand um, health issues and what causes them and what works and what helps people um, get um, resolution in health and socio-economic uh, conditions. Also how to access services. So these things unfold over time and also the um, positions of people's lives changes over time, including migration, who's in the household. So to be able to follow up and keep track of people for a long period of time, this is a very great advantage of this particular research site here. And as a scientist, the second thing that's so important here is that the, the, when I say keeping track of people, it is at a population level, which means within a space of about 30 villages here, every single human being is in this uh, research register operation. It's called a health and demographic surveillance system and these people are followed up um, several times and on a routine basis to have routine measurements about what's, who they are, what's happening in their households and what has changed over time. And at a population level, this means we can do much more valid research. When we take a sample from this and go and visit people in a sample for a special study like the one that I lead on migration and health and how to keep migrants healthy while they're migrating, we can take a sample from the population database and then follow up those people over long periods. And that means that the information we generate is has a high validity, we can trust the statistics. And one interesting thing about this research, we go back to back to the same people, but in my study we're also following up migrants wherever they go, Johannesburg, Polokwane, other places. And usually for studies like this it's very hard to keep track of people and that makes the science, the, the statistical inference harder. But we keep track of people in such a way that 95% uh, of the people that started the study are still in the study, even after four waves of data collection on our migration and health study. That's what I mean about infrastructure and stability. But it's not a simple thing. Hum the, the communities have to be very accepting, so that means communities have to benefit, participate. Citizen science is a thing here. People participate, they willingly speak about what's happening with them and then the unit here with the university feeds back the res research results and has dialogue with communities with various uh, purposes but including um, helping people resolve issues and uh, helping them contribute to science. So it's a really community and university initiative. The other thing about population level, which is so important and what makes it unprecedented here, is that the government wants information at a population level. They want to know what's happening in populations. So we may know about clinic attendance and know what people come to a clinic for or a health center. It's very nice to know what's happening at the population level because somebody might not attend a clinic even though they have a certain illness. And so the population level is very good for understanding things that the policymakers want to understand and we produce our work uh, especially to show uh, how it's relevant for the, the country of South Africa. So the, one of the most important things for me, I'm an implementation scientist, I look at the real world effect of interventions in the community and because we have uh, this demographic surveillance where we really understand uh, the community, every person that's living in the community, we can take random samples 
of representative people within the community to look at the impact of interventions on them. So for example, with the DREAMS impact evaluation, we could follow up really representative young people in the community and see if DREAMS had an impact on HIV prevention, for example. In the case of this new grant that I've got because of this infrastructure from the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation to look at PrEP implementation, pre HIV pre-exposure prevention implementation amongst young people, because of this infrastructure, we can look at the population effect in the groups of people that receive the intervention compared to those that receive the normal intervention and therefore really understand real world effect of the interventions. The other thing that SAPRIM provides is this link with the clinics. So we actually know what happens in standard of care, what's happening normally for people that come to clinics, and we can compare that with what happens when we do a new thing, such as delivering um, peer navigator-led youth interventions in the community. And we can see if more people come to the clinic because of our intervention compared to without our intervention because we are collecting this information in the clinics. So this is a huge resource. It brings large numbers of other grants because no other place can look at the real world population effective interventions that we know work in clinical trials or in special specialist clinics. And so that's a huge advantage. The third thing that I think is amazing about this infrastructure is that it's a basis to really train the next generation of data scientists, demographers, biostatisticians, but also implementation scientists. In this setting, I'm able to set up a, a kind of center of implementation science excellence because we have this infrastructure to look at the real world effect of interventions and therefore the scalability of interventions. And the final importance of this relationship is Ari's been here for decades working closely with the community, very much understanding the community, being able to get feedback from the community through the surveillance infrastructure. And so we can answer the questions that the community are telling us to really engage through public engagement unit. What are the health issues that are important for the community? What matters to the community? What should we be doing next? And for example, the community have told us that adolescent mental health is important and we can make that a priority in our next strategic goal. So this infrastructure allows us to collect the real information from the community, but also engage and ask them to tell us what research questions matter, what studies matter, and ensure that the studies we do answer the questions that matter here. The role of the CAP is to stand between uh, the, the community and ARI. The, the, the community wants to uh, to speak with the R. We are the bridge of them. We are uh, uh, representing them. Uh, we as CAP, we do have some meetings with the with the Indunas. So we explain to them that uh, our people are going to come, uh, maybe to to have the meetings, community dialogues, uh, road shows, and the the scientists are to get the opportunity to, 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 to deliver or to speak to the community uh, what they have or what their research uh, is about. After the doctor has spoke to us, he came to, to, to the meeting with us and he explained to us, before he comes to, to the community, he explained to us what the, the, the study is about. And where we have to listen to, to, to the study and ask some questions. If we are satisfied about what they, they, they are going to, 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 to study in our community, uh, they ask us to, to, to sign the, the, the consent form. Uh, I, as a chairperson and the secretary, we have to sign that consent form. After we are satisfied that uh, this study is is straightforward, it has got nothing to do or to, 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 to harm the, the people. So we, tell, we, we start signing that form, which means he's free to, to, to continue with his studies in our community. So with COVID, we were monitoring the signal from China as we do many other signals. Um, and initially we thought it was, you know, just one of these alarms that don't turn into anything. But then obviously um, in the case of COVID, it turned out the virus could spread between people and, and the, we had a global pandemic. So the first study was really a unique study in that it was one of the largest and most intensive studies um, of COVID-19 aiming to, to, to look below the surface 
of what we normally measure with COVID-19. Um, so for many respiratory viruses, uh, we know that, that the cases that get sick and get tested are really not representative of what's happening in the community. The reason why we use the Agincourt uh, Saprin site, which is a demographic surveillance site, is firstly because we had a very long-standing collaboration with them. Our original first study had been done uh, with them. And also because it, it's, a, it's a rural community um, with a very well-characterized population over many, many years. So, so in our study, we weren't only able to, to benefit from the results of our very intensive sampling and testing of people, but we also had access to all of that historical data and data on the broader community, which really allowed us to then be able to take those results also to, to the next level in terms of doing additional and more complex um, analyses. In my research interest areas are in HIV prevention among adolescents and young people. I'm interested in adapting and uh, developing and evaluating school-based health promotion interventions that are looking at improving the sexual reproductive health, uh, well-being and uptake of services for school-going children in our rural district of Umuganya Kude. And uh, this is part of my Wellcome Trust um, Fellowship and I'll be using the health demographic surveillance area, looking at the schools that are within this area, uh, looking at the clinics facilities and optimizing it with the PrEP implementation study. One of the other studies that I'm working on that is based um, in link with the SAPRIN is the one that is funded by the UNFPA and it's a SAPRIN study that is done across three SAPRIN sites. Dimamo, Agincourt, and um, here us at Ari, where we are nesting our study within the call center facility of the SAPRIN. And uh, we're looking at uh, interviewing telephonically 900 participants, 450 women and 450 men, looking at their access to uh, sexual reproductive health services during emergencies. Like you know, COVID-19 came and no one was prepared for it. So we wanted to see how can we use uh, HDSS sites to monitor and uh, health outcomes such as sexual reproductive health services. So we find that during COVID period, there were uh, restrictions that were put in, time, uh, in trying to curb uh, the spread of uh, COVID. Some of them which included the hard lockdown, which means people could not access uh, essential services such as your contraception, your antenatal care, your postnatal care. Uh, including HIV prevention, treatment and care services in our community. So this uh, SAPRIN study is really key in that it helps us uh, to compare findings across three sites that are using demographic surveillance areas. And we're also doing all the uh, interviews telephonically to see that should we have another emergency, how best can we use this platform to um, monitor and uh, check health outcomes among key, uh, our populations in our setting and I'm currently a project manager for one of the studies in the unit which focuses on health and aging. So the project basically it's a longitudinal cohort based study um, which has been running um, since 2014. Um, we're working with people older from the ages of 40 and up. So since 2014 we've been following people um, until now and then we do the follow-up um, every two years with the study participants and um, our cohort sample. So we draw the cohort sample from the Agent Court HDSS platform, um, which really show us the powerful, um, the power of having such an app, um, a platform in Agent Court. And then in terms of the study aim, so what we're trying to understand in the project is basically to understand um, how all the adult health and well-being changes over time or changes as people age. So that's what we're trying to understand and basically to understand um, risk factors for all the people for dying or developing certain health conditions and we're also interested in understanding resilience factors which basically are factors that um, increases one's likelihood of staying healthy. So that's what we are basically interested on. And we hope that um, the results generated from this program, which is health and aging, will help us to understand, not only to understand the health or adult health in the aging court area, but also to understand adult health in South Africa in general, especially in rural areas, and also to help us understand how best um, to solve um, adult health in South African populations.